Hello, everyone. Um, as you can see up on your screen, I've pulled up our four semi-creepy old cabinet cards. Um, we are looking at a few scans. These are sort of um, an example of the Facebook of the 1800s with the early invention of the camera. Uh, people would trade these wonderful cabinet cards uh, with each other and their friends to have pictures and portraits of each other, each other's children, you know, thinking about where where we are now with Christmas cards and, and holiday cards and sharing um, photos on Facebook. I would argue this is a very early version of that photographically. So you're looking at a selection of some particularly beat up cabinet cards from the 1800s, which I own. So these are all antiques that I have scanned and I have provided for you for the purposes of this technical exercise and this demo. And yes, they are creepy, but I promise you this photo restoration uh, activity, this technical exercise is going to be an excellent boot camp for learning about advanced uh, layering and compositing in Photoshop and really having to solve through problems. So your task working with one or two, if you'd like to be very ambitious, of these cabinet cards, your task is to restore this cabinet card so you're getting rid of some of the, the, the bad markings, some of the ink splatters, and the degradation that's happened to these prints. And so, for example, with this one, isn't this guy's hair just freaking awesome? I feel like it's coming back, though, really. Um, you'll notice they're scanned at very high resolution. So when you zoom in on these cabinet cards, you'll notice a bunch of different imperfections. So there are uh, stains, there are wrinkles, there are sometimes tears. Now, you don't have to do, like, the most perfect job ever, but I'd like you to really tackle uh, some of the bigger major problems in your chosen cabinet card and start to get really comfortable with what we talk about a lot in our class and with uh, pushing around pixels in Photoshop, which is dot, 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 wait for it, non-destructive editing. And non-destructive editing essentially means, as we've talked about in our past demos, uh, non-destructive editing means making Photoshop layers and keeping track of those layers so that you are not editing a, uh, the background layer or a duplicate of the background layer, which ultimately will speed up your workflow because you can always go back and change any of those edits. And two, it keeps your file size low. It keeps your file size manageable. So um, you don't double that file size unintentionally by duplicating the background layer. Um, which I would argue is a pretty, you know, amateur hour move. Um, a lot of early Photoshop users will duplicate that background layer, but doing that does not give you the opportunity to actually go back and um, adjust things on a layer itself. So today I'm going to show you exactly what that means. Um, so yeah, we have these four cabinet cards. I'm going to make a few edits to each of them. Uh, so you can pick any of them that you want to go the extra mile with for your technical exercise, but I'm going to be looking at some of the specific issues that each of these four cabinet cards has. And we'll start here because, I mean, seriously though, this guy's hair is just awesome. Um, great. So the first thing I want to do, and by the way, if you haven't grabbed your notebook, please pause this video right now. Grab a notebook to take some notes on keyboard shortcuts that will be very useful throughout this process. The first keyboard shortcut we're going to use is uh, Command Shift N on a Mac. It will be Control Shift N on your PC computer. And I'm going to call this one, this, this is a new layer, Command Shift N is a new layer. I'm going to call this um, Wrinkle because I can see this huge wrinkle going across our um, wonderful little baby. Maybe this is a baptismal photo since the baby's wearing like a white gown. I'm going to call this wrinkle. So everything that I do on the wrinkle layer will only affect stuff on the wrinkle layer, which helps me out a lot. So I'm going to hit command plus to zoom in a bit. 
And wow, that wrinkle just goes smack dab through this kid's eye. So we're going to start with an easier area to start problem solving. Let's start here because we have a lot of information to pull from. Um, in fact, if I want to modify this layer even further, since I know that the wrinkle damage in this, um, those like little tears are, are pretty obvious, I might even end up making multiple layers for them. I'm going to call this wrinkle uh, clone heal, which just helps to remind me that anything that I'm doing to this layer is a result of the clone stamp tool or the healing brush tool. So let's get started with the clone stamp. The clone stamp is located over here on uh, your toolbar. It looks like a actual stamp and we can get to it simply by hitting the S button on your keyboard, Mac or PC. Like with any of your brush tools, your, um, your layer your layer masking tools, you can modify the size and the hardness here. I'm actually gonna pull my hardness down to maybe 39, 38%, maybe 50%, kind of keep it midway. We'll see how that looks. And just like with your brush tool, I can modify the size of my clone stamp by hitting those bracket keys. Those hard bracket keys that are located just underneath your delete key on your keyboard and slightly to the left. So with the clone stamp tool, this is sort of like the joke tool of Photoshop. Everyone knows about the clone stamp tool and you know, just as much as you can Photoshop that person out, you can clone stamp that person out is very much part of the language around uh, Photoshop users. With the clone stamp tool, what I need to do is find a, a target or a source area that's similar to what I want to add to an area that I want to make disappear in order to make that happen. So in order to grab my source area, which I'm gonna actually select right next to this wrinkle here, I'm gonna hit the Alt or Option button and you notice my brush turns into like a little target looking thing. And then I'm going to click. And now my stamp, as you can see, is actually that, um, it's a stamp of that target area. And as I start spreading this around, it's actually gonna move that target area. It's gonna go up and down, et cetera, around. So, if I hit option click, I can start to impose that target area over here. Now, important to mention, when I say I'm pulling over that target area, you want to be very conscious of, you know, if you start seeing little areas where it looks like things are being duplicated too clearly, um, and that will probably come up as we're, as we're working through this, but you know, if I were to clone like part of this blotch here, you'll notice it will literally start pulling in the entire outline of that just by doing a direct clone of that blotchy area. Now I'm gonna hit Command Z here to make this go away. But if I really see something that I don't like, I can always use my eraser tool or E to uh, eliminate it. So I'll hit the Alt or Option key again and um, start to make this part of the wrinkle here disappear. Again, you don't want to hold on to the clone stamp tool in the same place for a super long period of time. You kind of want to linger around. For example, like if I kept pulling this up, then all of a sudden I lose that crisp edge of where the cabinet card was printed. So I'm gonna hit Z right there and I'm actually gonna clone from another area of the card so that I can get that crisp edge running through here and eliminate that wrinkle. So I can kind of line up that edge. I can you know, eliminate some of the wrinkle over here and that helps quite a bit. Uh, this is gonna be the case once I get to the top of this kid's hair as well. And the forehead, I'm constantly sort of coming over and clicking. Now, you notice here, I can definitely see a line where I've made that clone happen. So I'm gonna hit Command Z, and because we're dealing with skin, because there's sort of a soft focus effect that's happening, the eyes aren't totally sharp, I'm gonna actually soften up my brush to like a, I don't know, let's say 16%. Let's see how that, how that feels. And then I'm gonna boop, make it a little bit bigger. The bigger and softer your brush is, the more of a universalized effect you're gonna get. And 
uh, you'll see kind of how that works as we as we walk through these uh, cabinet cards together. But now you're you're not seeing the line where I pulled across that clone stamp tool, and you're really starting to see like a smoothing out of stuff, right? Um, and I'm gonna hit Command plus plus and make that brush even smaller so that I can start cleaning up the area underneath the eye because the face is actually a pretty small part of this particular cabinet card. The closer you zoom though, man, the creepier it starts to get. So, you know, maybe work on this at like an hour for an hour at a time and then take a break just so that, uh, you know, there aren't any ghosts around or anything freaky like that. Just kidding. Um, yeah, so I can go through and really start removing some of these, uh, some of these wrinkles and splotches by uh, selecting over from my clone stamp tool. And you're, you're watching like, as I'm, oh, see, every time I notice an area that's like, nope, nope, I can tell that that happened, I'm going to go back and redo it because I don't want my cloning to call attention to itself. You want it to be invisible. Like if someone looked at your, at your cabinet card afterwards, they would never know the lengths at which you went through to get rid of stuff. See, I can see that one. So I really need to select information that's right next to, right next to my my target area and it gets tricky too when like one side is like this and one side is like this it's like well which one do i pull over how soft do i make my brush cool so what's great about working non-destructively i just did a bunch of work you know i'm gonna in fact save right now don't forget to do that especially on this project because i feel like with this kind of work, you can turn on some good music and just jam out and edit for hours and hours and forget to save. So save frequently, save at the beginning, command S all the way through. Uh, don't forget about that. So I'm gonna say command uh, cabinet card scan four underscore edit because I'm gonna wanna keep both the original as well as my edit so I can kind of position them next to each other. Now, um, the great thing about working non-destructively is I can come over to this layer where I've just been working and I can disappear that eye and I can see all of that line that I've eliminated. Now, this is very, very nitpicky, but I can totally see some of the artifacting between um, you know, where I sort of pulled my brush through on that clone it becomes more obvious the more I turn the eyeball off and on. And this is where this is where the, the use of the bigger brush can be really helpful to eliminate some of that um, added information. So if I grab my clone stamp tool again, S, and I make my brush really, 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 really big, uh, and I'm gonna actually set it to like 6% hardness, a really, really big brush, really smooth. I'm gonna select this area, option click or alt click and just pull that across like one big sweep of motion and I can start to get rid of some of these areas that look like they could be duplicated. So I hope that that makes sense. Now obviously I would go back through and keep working on these wrinkles but I want to show you a couple of other interesting things that you can do um, working non-destructively and a few additional tools. So um, I'm going to make a new layer that I'm going to call command shift N layer one. I'm going to call this one, uh, face spot heel, because if you notice, um, our, our mother and our father both have a bunch of foxing little dots on their faces. This is actually caused, um, it's called foxing and it's, it's caused by, uh, when mold, starts to accumulate on the surface of old paper. So um, if, you, if you've ever wondered, why is archival paper so much more expensive? One, it doesn't yellow, and two, it's far more resistant to foxing, which is a process uh, of paper molding that generally happens inevitably, especially if paper is exposed to 
uh, humid conditions of any kind. So uh, instead of using the clone stamp tool, because I could certainly use a clone stamp tool for this, but at some point, you know, if you're making photos, you might actually use this method to get rid of your own um, blemishes or imperfections in your own skin, uh, because 2021 Photoshop. Um, but so I could I could clone this out by hitting option click. Works like a charm. But if I want an even smoother approach to getting rid of individual dots on the skin or individual blemishes that might be on the skin, what I can do is actually go into the healing brush tool or J which is the tool over here on the left-hand bar that kind of looks like a Band-Aid. If I right-click on the healing brush, um, there are definitely multiple... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> multiple different um, healing brush tool options. Drinking a little bit of tea here. <laughs> I can use the healing brush tool and I can use the spot healing brush tool. The healing brush tool, just the normal one, actually works very similarly to your clone stamp tool. I'm gonna hit my target area by hitting option click and pull that over. Option click and pull that over. See how nice and soft that is? What's great about the algorithm here for your healing brush tool is that it samples intuitively from surrounding areas and fills in that space, fills in that dot with areas that it thinks make sense based on surrounding content. So this is really great for smoothing out skin, really great for getting rid of blemishes, and it's a lot less noticeable. It's a lot more subtle than the clone stamp tool, which does tend to call attention to itself. So I can go over here, option click, and that's so nice. It just starts to eliminate some of this space. Now, if I want to use the spot healing brush tool, I'm going to hit uh, control click here uh, or right click, and I'm going to grab the spot healing brush tool. And with this one, you don't have to click as much, and it's great for specific little dots. Sometimes it works. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, I want to make sure, by the way, I should have said this at the very, very beginning um, because my Photoshop is set up for this and yours might not be. So if you're struggling right now, I will post this in the, um, in the comments here in the video, but it's really important that up top you have your, um, your brush set to content aware here on your healing brush and you want to sample all layers. So this is really going to help it to mesh in. If you're using the clone stamp tool or S, I want you to make sure that you have aligned checked and I want you to make sure that you have current and below checked for that clone stamp tool. So um, I want you to make sure that those are all set in that main dialog uh, box, little toolbar up at the top. You wanna make sure it says aligned checked and then you want to sample current and below if yours is not already set up that way and maybe you've just been watching this video because you know creepy cabinet cards and you haven't even dug in yet when you do please do make sure that all of this is set correctly so um, now if I go back to my spot heal brush tool let's make sure we're on spot healing uh, I have content to wear sample all layers and I can just start clicking away and these little dots are going to just disappear, which is so nice. So I can just click around, get rid of little dots. Now I, I can use this exact same uh, technique, this exact same tool to get rid of some of these little spots in the background. So if I go to Command Shift N, I can do like background dust cleanup you're noticing I'm putting all of these on different layers at this point, hopefully. Um, don't need to hit option click. I can just start clicking away and these little dots will disappear. Um, 
you know, you can be very obsessive with this if you want to get in the zone and get at it. Um, I'm not going to be looking for super huge level of detail, but I do want you to kind of push yourself to experiment with these tools and get um, a strong sense of the differences between your spot heal tool, uh, your spot heal healing brush tool, your healing brush tool, your clone stamp tool, and how all of those different tools work and work differently from each other. So again, I'm going to use my healing brush tool here to sample some of his forehead. Starting to kind of clean it up. Maybe make it a little bit smaller to clean up some of the space around his mouth here. Here we go. And um, if I want, I can go back to where we started by just clicking on that eyeball right there, which is really nice. Now, here's another thought for you guys. Um, obviously, we have this really big uh, water spot here. Someone was fondly holding this cabinet card and they spilled part of their Manhattan on it uh, as they were laughing with joy. I don't know. Something happened here and we have this huge water spot in the middle of this cabinet card. What do we do? This is huge. Um, how, do we, how do we fix this without being super obvious about it? Well, here's what I would do in this kind of situation. And because today we're talking about um, advanced layering and layer masks. Um, what I'm actually going to propose to you to get rid of this is to pull from the space above this watermark. We're going to pull that in and use that as a layer to cover this up. And from there, we're going to modify that layer so it doesn't look like a direct copy of the background that's like right above, um, above the area that we're copying. So Let's turn that eyeball back on. Let's see our hard work here. Um, to do this, I'm going to grab my selection tool, my marquee tool, which we've talked about in our past demo. And I'm going to select a bigger area above this than what I need. And I'll show you why we're doing that uh, here in a moment. If I want it to be a little bit bigger on the side too, I can also go into my select tool and modify uh, or select and transform selection, which will allow me, if I hold down my shift key here, I can make it a little bit larger. Yeah, so I can always, once I start making that selection, I can always mod, uh, modify it afterwards. So now I have this selection. Um, I need to make sure that I have a bit of feathering going on. I'm going to be modifying it a bit, but always when I'm copying, pasting over something, uh, as a new layer, I want to make sure that I've gone in sel to select modify feather and I'm going to modify that by, yeah, five pixels sounds great. So now it's a little bit of a softer edge. Then I'm not going to just hit command C to copy because if you look right now, we have all of these layers. I want everything that's included in these layers to be in my copied selection. So I'm going to say edit copy merged which merges all of the layers in that copy. And then I can go to Command V to paste or edit V to paste. And I'm gonna call this uh, stain blotch removal. You can get creative with your names, whatever, whatever helps you remember what it is. <laughs> the worst thing is when you get really excited about an edit and then you just stop naming your layers. That's uh. It happened to me recently, believe it or not, it happens to everyone. Um, but try to try to be fairly conscious of maintaining that. So as you can see, I have this little square. I'm pulling it down. Um, that's looking pretty good, I would say. It's a little bit dark here. But that's the thing about our layer masks and how this is going to help us. So if I want to modify this even further from that selection, I can use my layer mask to sort of decide what parts of this little square band-aid I've put over our blotch, which parts I want to keep and which parts I don't want to keep. And for example, I definitely don't want to keep the part that is obstructing our little child's head here. To see 
sort of how these layers are interacting, what I'm also going to do is set the opacity here. See, now I can see this kid's head behind um, our square. I'm going to set my opacity to like 60, 62%. This allows me to see the head of the child that I don't want to lose. It also allows me to see the outline and general form of the blotch whoop, that I'd like to eliminate from our cabinet card. So what I'm gonna do from here, now that my opacity is down, I am gonna turn this back up to 100 here momentarily, but I'm going to grab my layer mask tool. I'm just gonna click that and that's gonna add a mask to this, this particular layer, which means I can grab my brush tool, which is a way to non-destructively select out which areas I want to keep and which areas I want to remove by hitting B. Maybe my brush is very big right now. Here we go. And awesome. It's a very soft brush right now. I can brush out those areas that I do not want. And I can pull them back in too. As you remember, if I hit X, I can bring back in that information, no problem. And uh, I'm trying to be careful because I don't want it to be obvious and I really only want to get rid of that blotch, nothing else around it. And this is gonna be a lot cleaner way to do this as opposed to like, clone stamping a bunch of times over this blotch because that's gonna call attention to itself really fast. Let's see how I did. That's not bad at all, actually. That is not bad at all. I'm gonna uncheck that eye. I can see here I have this wrinkle that got duplicated that's pretty obvious. I have this splotch which got duplicated which is pretty obvious. So my, ne my next task is to um, clean, clean the background up so it does not look quite as obvious as it was before. So yet again, we're going to make a new layer, Command-Shift-N. I'm going to call this blotch clone cleanup because I'm cleaning up that um, that area that I have. I want to make sure that my uh, clone stamp tool S is set to aligned and current and below. And I am specifically going to focus on eliminating this wrinkle here. Yep. And specifically getting rid of this splotch here, which looks a bit suspiciously similar to its above counterpart where it came from. So now that's starting to look really nice. And when in doubt, use a big clone stamp brush, a really big clone, really soft brush. What are we at? Yeah, 6%, perfect. And I can clone part of this above area so that it doesn't look quite as obvious. Because sometimes like a soft brush will also tend to call quite a bit of attention to itself. So that is a good start. Now, what I would suggest you do is work around um, your image. So work around slowly through your image uh, utilizing different layers. You know, I would make a different layer for the wrinkle on his pant leg. I would make a different layer for maybe the wrinkle on her dress. Um, you know, like the more layers, the better, because you'll be able to go back and find out where your work got stored. If you end up with like a solid like 50 layers, what you can even do is start putting your layers into a group. For example, for these two blotch things that I did to get rid of that big spill in the middle, I can actually pull these both into their own folder or group, which really helps. So I can just call this blotch, which was that big stain in the middle. And now both of those layers are represented through this layer group that I've created, which is super helpful. So, 
Uh, at this point, we've talked a bit about the healing brush tools, clone stamp tools, the need to create new layers each time you're going to target a particular area. The next couple of things I want to talk about as far as our photo restoration are a few little introductory concepts in curves and in color correction, because you'll notice with many of these cabinet cards, let's command S this one right now, um, with many of these cabinet cards, they're yellowed, the color seems a bit off. Now, if we were meeting in person in a real uh, studio, I would give you the original card so you would have that as a reference. So given that our class is uh, meeting in a hybrid online format, I'm going to trust your judgment on um, how you feel that the color and the exposure should look on these. But something to keep in mind is that anytime you make a scan, and maybe you're using a scan at home, but anytime you, you make a scan, the color, the contrast is going to be a bit flat. Um, it's not gonna have quite that like vibrance or dynamic quality that we, we would expect from a contemporary photograph. Now, that being said, <laughs> These certainly are not contemporary photographs, so I, I definitely do not want you to push color or curves or exposure anywhere to where it like looks like an Instagram filter or something, you know, some kind of like if the card comes out purple, like that's not what we want to see. I want you to really take a, a, a careful nuanced look at how you apply your alterations as far as curves and color on your cards. So let me show you what I mean. Um, and you might decide to do this, uh, you know, at some point in the uh, at the beginning or at some point as you are um, uh, editing in the middle or you might choose to do all of your detailed cleanup work first and then pull back in your color edits and exposure edits later. It's kind of up to you, but you do want to know where those layers are uh, in the mix here in all of our layers. Let's talk color first. Um, I'm gonna go to my adjustments tab here in Photoshop and grab hue saturation. Um, the important thing to note is that while I can absolutely modify hue, you know, so we have crazy colors going on. I can do that. I, I don't particularly want to do that, nor do I, I I'll like pretty much never use a master as far as my color modification. I want to target each color in the picture separately. Each color should be addressed separately. Uh, I don't want to, you know, increase the saturation, certainly not, you know, on this card. I don't want to make it black and white. That's not that's not the goal because the cabinet cards were not printed black and white. And uh, this is my lightness. This is not the same as exposure. This literally sort of adds um, a sort of lightening or darkening effect comprehensively. It's not the most useful, especially when you're targeting a master. So in my hue saturation, I always want to target a specific color. And I can see in my cabinet card here, it is very yellow. So I'm gonna change master to yellows. And I am going to specifically desaturate my yellows. Look how much nicer that is. I'm not going from this to like black and white here. I'm, I'm just simply desaturating all of the yellow cast here. And then I can lighten up my yellows just a little bit to freshen that up. Let's pull this in just a little bit. I don't wanna, I don't wanna take away like the sepia quality of this, but the yellow is, is quite harsh to look at on the eyes. So I've targeted yellows. Um, I don't really have a lot of the other colors represented in this. Maybe, maybe there's some reds here like in her fingertips. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's seeing some reds. So I might desaturate my reds a little bit. And um, yeah, that's about all we need. I desaturated yellow by minus 27 points. I desaturated red by minus 36 points. Uh, let's turn this eyeball off and on. That's just a lot nicer to look at now. Awesome. Um, 
To modify the exposure and kind of the punchiness of the digital image, we're gonna do two things. We're gonna use our curves adjustment layer, and I'm also going to show you guys how to use sharpening on these um, uh, photos, which will be restoring. So I'm gonna go over to my curves layer, and I am going to pop up the middle. I'm gonna pop up my midtones a little bit. I wanna watch out because I don't want to pop my curves up anywhere to where you know these people really start looking like ghosts because their faces are all blown out. I'm just gonna pop it up a little bit so that I can restore some detail in my shadows, in those shadow midtones. Um, this is my black point. This little arrow represents the darkest dark in my picture. I'm gonna pull that in a little bit to kind of increase the contrast a bit. And this is my whitest white. Everything that you see in this graph mapped out in your curves layer is a mapping of pixels from, a, a mapping of number of pixels from dark, dark black to white, white, white with all of your midtones available in this uh, grayscale gradient that you see, which represents the Y axis. So. Over here, you notice this huge, huge spike really close to my whitest white. That huge spike in white pixels is accounting for the fact that all of my people, including my baby's dress here, have super, super white pixels in them. Like they're very bright. They're definitely on the white end of the spectrum. If I pull in this area a little bit, it's gonna help me pull in my highlights. Now, I don't wanna do it necessarily all the way because then as you can see, things get kind of weird really fast, but I'm just gonna pull it in to where my whitest whites are represented within, um, within the gamut of this histogram spectrum. We call this graph a histogram. Now let's see what that looks like if I turn my eyeball off and on. It's a lot more vivid, it's a lot nicer, it's sort of punching through very, very nicely. Now, if I, if I don't like how bright it gets on her face, for example, the great thing about working in adjustment layers, which are layer masks off the get-go, is that I can erase out any part of this that I don't want. So if I hit my B button for brush, um, I can brush out areas that I feel got a little bit too much attention. And you'll notice that little erasure comes up here as a dark area on my layer mask. Uh, if I hit X, just like before, I can erase out some of this. X again, I can invert it and uh, start brushing in some of her dress, for example. So this is essentially taking out the effect of the curves layer that I used. Now, if that's too much, what I can also do is change my brush opacity to 50, 58, 50%. So the effect won't be quite as severe as I'm brushing in some of these areas. Uh, it's kind of up to you using your eyes to make those determinations. But again, we don't wanna see anything that's been like super saturated, etc. So this is all of that gone and put back together. If I hold down my Alt key and click on my background, I can see all of the work that I've done so far on this cabinet card. It's starting to come together. Um, I'm gonna zoom in and show you guys a couple of things. This, can you tell what this is? This is a fingerprint. I don't know how it got there, I'm guessing um, you know, someone, someone was holding it or picked it up with something really greasy on their hands. And it's really hard to see through that fingerprint layer where her shoes are. Um, there's other markings that have the same sort of gray quality to them. It's quite creepy actually. Um, I would say if you want to navigate managing some of that, great. But an area like this, even with all of the tricks in the book, this, this alone is, it probably represents like two or three hours of work. So what I would do to address this fingerprint since it's so bright, you know, or this, 
this big line right here, down here, you know, I could spend hours pulling in our, our flooring and stuff. These cards are not going to be perfect once you get through with them, but so it doesn't call quite as much attention to itself. I could choose to kind of darken up this area in general so it falls from the foreground more to the background of the image. And to do this, I'm going to grab my uh, curves layer. Let's name, let's name this. Let's name this hue saturation we did. We'll call this yellow out. We'll call this one um, our first curves layer. We'll say universal curve. And with this one, we'll call fingerprint areas. So with this curve, I'm actually going to darken it and it's going to be applied comprehensively to my whole image. But you'll notice that's okay because we are going to fill it in with black and then just paint in the areas that we actually want to keep. And to do this, I can go to edit fill and grab black and say, okay. Or I can go to shift F5, one of my favorite keyboard shortcuts in Photoshop and edit fill with black, which means I can use my brush B and I'll have to invert it here. I'll hit X to darken some of these areas and make them sort of fall to the background. Maybe even on her dress a little bit, just so it's like not quite as noticeable. And at this point, you know, I'm like literally sort of painting. These ones where these markings are uh, darker than the content behind them. I'm going to leave them alone for now because I would actually want to use probably an, uh, a light, a lighter curves layer to get rid of them because they're darker than their background, if that makes sense. Cool. So let's see if that helped. Oh yeah. Those areas are definitely a lot less intense. And it'll help too if I can go back in and sort of fine tune some of that with a bit more cloning so that those little dust marks, et cetera, um, fall to the background. Uh, here's our, oh, oh, right. So you can also see all of the areas I've cloned if I just get rid of my background layer by, um, you know, turning that eyeball off and, and on again, which is pretty cool. You can see that wrinkle that I worked on over here, those little dots over here, the face. Awesome. Um, so now maybe I'm ready to go back, uh, Command Shift N, and I'm gonna work on the uh, border clone because this spot is really annoying me. And to do that, I'm gonna grab S for clone stamp, option click and I can pull over some of my background here. Awesome. Again, we want this to be close, but if it's better to leave it, it's, it's always better to leave it looking authentic than to overdo something in Photoshop that's gonna call attention to itself and make it seem like it was Photoshopped. So if uh, you're coming to a point where you're like, am I overworking this? and you feel like you are, then it's probably uh, your cue to work on some other aspect of the piece. Just, you know, you can kind of move around as you'd like. So this one, yeah. So I can go work around the border, and obviously I've left quite a few other areas that still need some attention. Alt, click. This is already looking like way, 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 way better. Hit Command S to save. The last thing I want to show you guys um, how to do, we've talked about now at this point, we've talked about putting layers into groups. We've talked about uh, clone stamp, healing brush, spot healing brush tool, color correction, curves, 
layer masks when we took out that blotchy area. The last thing I want to show you is how to correctly sharpen an image, especially a scan or a photograph that you're gonna, that you've taken on a high, high resolution DSLR that you're gonna put into a show, etc. Sharpening is always a good idea to add a bit more punch to your image. Uh, especially if you're gonna put it into uh, print format. But I think it's always just a good practice to get into the habit of, of doing. Um, this sharpening technique is something you want to do at the very end. Like you've gone through, you've, you've cleaned everything up, there's no more dust spots, you're happy with the color correction, You've gotten rid of all of the wrinkles. You're feeling really good about your progress so far, okay? Because what we're going to do with the sharpening is actually create a new file because we want to be able to go back to this file, but we also want to have the sharpening version, the sharpened version of our file. And because we've conserved so much data by working in layers and working non-destructively here, now is the time when we move forward and we do create a copy of this whole piece so that we can have some really nice, subtle, punchy sharpening on top. And so I'm gonna show you best practices for how to sharpen the image, but I'm gonna do that in our next video. So please save your work. Please wrap up um, all of the areas that you've been cleaning up on your cabinet card, and uh, we'll see you for the sharpening process momentarily.